here is really cool. I mean, the most iconic car of the 50s is a 59 Cadillac. And you can see the biggest tail fins on a GM car ever made. And we have two 59 Cadillac coupes, one right beside the other. You can compare the front to the back and the back to the front. All the styling on that was meant to look like a um, jet-powered plane back in the 50s. Everybody was into the whole space and fast airplane era. And, of course, you see what... After we left the drive-in, 1960s and 70s was really all about getting in your old car and crossing the country on historic Route 66 and seeing all the attractions. And that's what this whole area represents, Route 66. And you've got a shady used motors, you've got roadside souvenirs. So this is all for And Route of course, 66. no trip across the country is complete until you get the whole way to the West Coast and the Golden Gate Bridge. Okay, now it's making sense. Yeah, it makes okay. sense. Yeah. So when you're over there earlier is east, and uh -huh. it kind of comes to the west. Oh, wow. That's, that's very cool. That's what that whole theme was about how we decorated the walls with murals, traveling from the east to the west. That is a cool car. Did you ever watch them? What's that? Those are some serious fins they got on this. Yeah, that one and this one as well. So this was the top of the 300G was the top of the line Chrysler, not only for power, but you know, styling and luxury. If you step back in here, you can even see how the interior, you got to see the interior in this 300G. It's so cool. Is that a rare car, that green one? 59 Cadillac is a pretty rare car, so it was the top of the line General Motors. General Motors had the ladder of cars. If you were the working man, you had a Chevrolet. If you were doing a little better and you had performance minded, you went Pontiac or Oldsmobile. The better one was the Buick, but the top of the line was the Cadillac. Oh, wow. So that was your progression and you know your status. If you had a Cadillac, you were like Elvis, you were doing really great. <laughs> but a 1959 Cadillac was the top of the line car, you know. Unless it was a convertible, that would, you know, that coupe right there. Look how much glass is on that. You know, almost oh the word. entire top is surrounded by glass. Oh. And that was the thing back then. They wanted it to look like a cockpit of an airplane, you know, like a fighter jet. You know, you had more of that you could see all around you. Um, and that was the style. Really cool. All right, so let's check this one out. So a 300G Chrysler, if you look at that dash, you would swear you're getting into a jet or a spaceship <laughs> at the time. Look at that. Well, we like we, we like uh, we're into that type of stuff, outer space and rockets and stuff. Mm -hmm. So you say if this felt like you were going in a rocket, it felt like you were climbing be... into the cockpit of something that could go supersonic speed. When you but this would that. be Lane's car because I don't like. I mean, I like speed, but he he sometimes could go crazy. And yeah. I'm just like, oh my god, well, I don't like turn. You go over a hundred in these, it feels like it's two hundred. But oh crap! Oh yeah, I would not get in a so car with that. It's big and then. floaty, but push button <laughs> dash and a control for everything. And, you know, swivel out comforts, you know, uh, swivel seats. Look, it even has bucket seats in the back and the console yeah. extends to the back seat. I mean, this was super fancy and high end. You couldn't get any fancier than that in a Chrysler. Now, here's a dumb question. Do these seats actually spin like this one looks like it's spinning or no? It, it spins so you can get in. It won't spin much farther than that. Oh, That's wow. for your ease of getting in. Then it spins over, goes straight, and it locks in. No. Uh -huh. yeah. So, uh, Too bad they don't make seats some, like that anymore. Some cars you <laughs> called that strato bucket. I, I think it was just <laughs> swivel bucket seat is really what you call that. But, yeah, fancy. It has a 413 cubic inch engine with dual carburetors. I mean, it, it was fast. People would take the engine out of this and put it in smaller cars and go even faster. Yeah, I love uh, little oddities like this. Mm -hmm. You don't see it on cars on the other no, the owner of this is from um, Huntington Valley as well as he also has a home in Hershey and he drives it. This is a drivable car. Oh, wow. So I think that's neat. That is neat. Not only is it a cool car, imagine what it's like to actually own it and drive it. Huh. Lots and lots of money. The world's largest collector of Tucker 
anything cars parts literature memorabilia engineering drawings pieces from the original factory and he preserved all that stuff and his family and foundation um, make gracious donations to this place every year and they they have donated all of that stuff and they have uh, put their their cars three actual tucker vehicles out of the 51 ever produced uh. are here um, on display with a fourth one we have a movie movie set car it's not a functioning car but it was in the movie yeah um oh, it was in the movie yeah. the actual movie mm -hmm. oh we want to see that don't we let you we're all about hollywood so when you come through here, you hear the, the history and the story of how David Kamek came about his cars and, and found out about Tucker's, but um, Preston Tucker, who had a racing heritage and made some things for the war effort for the United States government, designed a tank car, an armored car, that the military never bought. Um, from there, after the war was over, and he is, his, um, his factory in Ypsilanti, which was next to his house, where they were making gun turret parts for airplanes. <laughs> he decided when this war was over, he was going to design the most safe car and the coolest car and the fastest car people could buy. Um, so he super engineered the Tucker 48. And is this how the race cars kind of started to begin then? Well, he knew his stuff. He knew how cars handled and weight distribution and about disc brakes. And he wanted to design a car that had safety features in mind, like padded decks, yeah. lights that steered towards your your turn when it was dark, a car that could be rolled over and not be smushed, um, a car that had an engine in the rear that was down inside the chassis to give you lower center of gravity, and it could cruise and handle at 100 miles an hour. Um, this was all so just futuristic at the time. It took a lot of money, a lot of engineering to get it started. So he was a great businessman, or he had, he was a good marketing genius. He would advertise in magazines and did all this stuff. I mean, if you look at that car, nothing looks like that car or ever looked like that car. So they engineered this, but they were way behind and really weren't producing it. And they were overselling it right from the start. So they would sell the parts that would go on your car, like the luggage or the radio or um, the seat covers and guarantee that when your car showed up at the dealership they were going to put it in your car and you were going to move forward well at the time in the 1940s that was considered fraudulent to take your money and not oh. have a car produced for you so he got wrapped up in court proceedings from uh, the national securities team sec and people were making him stop production to go see what was going on in his factory. And it was backed by the big three, General Motors, Ford, um, and Chrysler, because I think they were all afraid of this competition. So six months later, after Preston Tucker, his family, his engineers, and everybody were in court, and everyone was trying to prove that they're fraudulent, they only produced 50 cars. When all that was over, he was... He um, was not charged with anything fraudulent, but the production in the factory that the cars were being built in all got stopped. So the car that almost could have come around and taken over was just not available for anybody. So the 51 that were made are highly sought after, and they're here for everybody to see, including the story and other um, production engines and transmissions that had problems that didn't make it into a car, pieces and parts of suspension. There's a test chassis. Um, this is a movie car. There were four fiberglass displays that looked like a car, some of which ran and drove, but this one did not, that were made for the movie, as well as real Tucker cars were in the movie, uh, which was made in 1988. But a lot of neat engineering. This display over here that was made uh, by Rob Ida showcases and shows you how that steerable front Cyclops headlight works. So you come over here, and you get to the center and the light goes off, you have to be actually steering 10 degrees one way or the other for that light to go on. 
And then, of course, the more you steer, the farther the light goes into your turn. Oh, wow. For somebody to design that in 47 or 48 was pretty ingenious. Plus, it looks cool. It is cool. Do you want to go turn the wheel? He. Sure, he does. Of course, back, I like to have fun. are pieces of the actual Tucker plant in engineering areas um, that the Kamek Foundation bought and preserved and gave to us to display. This is a, actually, to be honest, I wish they did make cars like this today. Because it's a great idea, isn't it? It is, because I have a hard time seeing at night, like no lie, where I have to put my head beams mm -hmm. on. If I had this, I could actually see if a deer's gonna come and stuff, because I already had that happen to my Honda Civic great? Yeah. about two years ago. So yeah, this well, is a great feature. I really